might see a little pop up there. Welcome now to those of you who are joining us on YouTube as well. I want to thank Itasca Bank for sponsoring this webinar. Sponsors like Itasca Bank help to keep these webinars free for everybody. Contact me for more information on sponsoring. Also, at the end of this webinar, you'll be taken to a page with a whole bunch of resources of things you might be interested in, such as our native plant guide, rain barrel information, and so much more, including our virtual tip jar. So if you're enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to donate. That helps to keep TCF to continue to do all the awesome stuff that we do because we do so much more than just webinars. And you can also check the box to become a member so that you can enjoy our wide variety of members only stuff. Upcoming webinars, we've been doing these since the shutdown, basically like last March. So this has been such a cool experience and I'm so glad I've been able to bring all these really awesome speakers. Um, so upcoming next week, February 3rd, how is it February almost already? I will be joined by Jacqueline with the Shed Aquarium to talk about tackling plastic pollution in the Chicago region. So definitely check in on that one. That's gonna be a really good one. And then February 10th, I will be back to talk about backyard bird watching in the winter. How to attract them, who's here, uh, feeder types, all that kind of great stuff. So uh, join me on February 10th and we'll be talking about birds again. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend Remick Ensweiler here and we're going to learn about what's going on at College of DuPage. Take it okay. away. Thank you, Jamie. All right, is everyone is everyone seeing everything here then? Okay. Shared you're screen? Yep, you're okay. good. Great. So this talk is titled Little Campus on the Prairie. There was a courier a student newspaper article back in the 90s that I fished out that had that title and I've I've kind of used it ever since because I think it's fitting. Um so we'll just dive into it. So this is me. Uh, my name is Remick Ensweiler. I've been here since June of 16. Before that, I worked at an ecological contractor, um, and then I sharpened my teeth before that with botanizing and learning the plants for the Illinois Natural History Survey. We went around the state and did botanical surveys of all the forests, wetlands, and uh, grasslands throughout the state. And before that, I spent a summer at uh, Capitol Reef National Park, which is a lesser known one down there, but still quite beautiful. Um, and I studied at U of I before that. So um, intro to prairie land, seems like you guys all have native plants, so that's good. You probably already know what about all this, but I'll go into it anyway. So what is a prairie? Um, well, a prairie is a grassland and the name prairie comes from the French word for meadow. So they just looked out, said there weren't trees, called it a meadow. Um, and so we kind of have the word prairie ever since. And we're also the prairie state. Um, so it's, it's important to kind of know what that is. Um, you can see on the map the extent of the prairie. Um, historically, when settlers went out west, they kind of considered them wastelands because there weren't trees. And they had come from Europe and Eastern uh, United States where it was forested land and where they could build their houses out of the land and use the trees and so when they weren't able to do that and it was really buggy and harsh and warm and cold or hot and cold um, they considered it wasteland and um, however they ultimately did settle it and and cleared it um, in large part due to the u.s government actually in 1862 they gave anyone above 21 years old 160 acres as long as they agreed to live on the land for five years. Now, because um, it was 1862, Confederate citizens, Confederacy citizens weren't allowed for this. It was a kind of political play by Lincoln to, to have the Union settle the West. Um, so that was a part of it as well. Um, and then in, 70, in 1873, they kind of built on that by making the timber uh, a, an act to encourage timber. And so people would get an additional 160 acres to plant, to till the grassland and plant trees. So that kind of started the human, um, humans changing the environment. Um, the, how they were able to efficiently do that in one human lifetime between 1830 and 1900 was with the steel Marlboro uh, plow, uh, originally invented by John Deere. Now there had been versions before John Deere, but John Deere did the most mass produced uh, plow. 
and prior to settlement there were 22 million of acres of prairie and after settlement there are about 2,000 acres of prairie which is probably well it's less now but approximately that much still um and it's mostly those areas that where the prairie remains are areas that weren't able to be farmed so bad farmland um and also along railroads and in cemeteries where they didn't farm the land so it happened really quickly the the destruction of the prairie um as you can see from that original map there were kind of three zones of the prairie so there's we live in the eastern tall grass prairie and then as you go west it's the mixed slash short grass prairie and then as you go west of that it's the short grass prairie um and the only difference between the two basically is precipitation and so we live in the wettest part um and then as you go west it gets more dry um the type of climate that the prairie exists on is a continental climate so that means anywhere where you find grasslands throughout the world they're not next to a large body of water that kind of regulates the temperature so because we don't have a big temperature regulator. And I know Lake Michigan is one uh, uh, like that, but it's not quite, doesn't quite play the role of an ocean. Um, it can be very hot and it can be very cold, um, as we all know, <laughs> um, and it can be very windy. And this created issues when they tilted over and the dust bowl occurred, which we'll go into a little bit. Um, and as we know, there are feast or famine rain events. So it's, it's a bit of a harsher climate, um and one that's a little less predictable you could say um so in order to kind of deal with the harsh climate and environment um we or i i actually oh, sorry i mixed my slides up here um so this this area from from plants going dormant year after year um, became a very diverse and um, productive repository of species and fertile repository of species. Um, and mo the mollusol soil was formed, which is what you kind of see at the picture. It's a fertile black soil, um, different from an alpha sol. So alpha sol soils are grayer soils that have less nutrition. Um, and those are found in forested lands. You can find them in Southern Illinois near Shawnee National Forest and also in, in the Southeast United States such as in Georgia and those, those sorts of forested areas. Um, around the world, grasslands similar to our prairie lands are located in Brazil, Argentina, and then also Mongolia and Russia, which had historically been the breadbasket of, of Europe and Russia uh, and the Middle East, and why that area has been kind of fought over for millennia, I mean, from Genghis Khan on down. Um, because of its fertile land. And while we don't grow as much wheat in America or in our prairie, we grow what the commodity that's most valuable and that's corn and soybeans these days. And we're able to do it because we have such fertile soil. Um, and then as you can see the dust, the dust storms that occur from the very windy environments when you don't have these long rooted prairie plants um, because you till them off and you planted short rooted farm uh, crops such as corn and wheat and things of that nature then then you can you can create the the capacity to form a dust storm and that's that's what happened in the in the 1930s and the dust bowl um, as we all are somewhat familiar with um, and so because of these harsh environments plants have had to adapt over the years so the main thing that plants um, have adapted by is by being able to grow underground where they can survive disturbance. So historically, there were large herds of bison that roamed the areas and trampled down the grasses and the and the forbs and or the flowering plants and the grasses. And so that was disturbance, and they were they had to be able to withstand that. Also, the, historically, there had been a lot of fires. So after a fire goes through, you know the plants have to remain fertile and able to grow come growing season. Um, their roots are, are very long, as you saw in the previous picture, and this is so that they can absorb moisture during dry periods. Um, a great couple pictures that Russ, Russell Kurt um, presented to the Board of Trustees back in the 90s show um, the difference between a turf grass area and a prairie area. So it's hard to read, but you can see July 18th, 1996, uh, he went out with a yardstick and recorded where it was drowning 
Um, the turf grass, which is very short rooted and doesn't act like a sponge the way prairie plants do. And then in, in the prairie preserve where you can see that there's no standing water. So this is kind of a great, a great way to convince people in charge that we need to change some turf grass to prairie grass if we have some issues with flooding. Um, a couple other ways that plants have adapted is that grasses have narrow leaves, which so they're able to hold on to a lot of their water. Um, they're also wind pollinated. Anyone that's detasseled corn or is familiar with tassels on corn, that's how corn is a grass and that's how corn spreads its pollen, utilizing the wind to, to put um, their stamen on the carpal of other, of other uh, corn plants. Um, and then also brightly colored flowers. So the flowering plants that you see that we'll see more later on in, these, in this presentation um, those attract pollinators, and that's how they're able to reproduce. All right, so ecological restoration. So humans, it's just an extension of what humans have always been doing. Humans have always been manipulating their environment, um, but it wasn't until late in the 20th century that there was a science around it. And it actually happened in nearby uh, Madison, Wisconsin, with this guy right here, Aldo Leopold, and a few others. Um, and they started kind of going through historical journals, finding what species had been there and kind of locating those species within the vicinity, trying to grow them, trying to put them in there, seeing if they survive. If they didn't survive, they adjusted their plans. And that's essentially, we do, we do essentially an extension of that to this day. Um, this this um, bench, as you can see here, is actually located in the preserves here on College of DuPage. It's called the Leopold Bench. It was um, designed by Aldo Leopold, and we've had multiple groups of students build these and put them in the nature preserves. So if you ever want to experience the posture of Aldo Leopold, and I mean, maybe don't bring the pipe because he always had a pipe, but come and sit and enjoy nature uh, out there. And that led us to leads us to Ray Schulenberg. So um, Ray Schulenberg was the first to kind of were one of the first to kind of do restoration in the Chicago suburbs. In 1962, he started the Schulenberg Prairie uh, at the Morton Arboretum. And he and Bob Betts were integral in getting both remnants around the region protected and also um, establishing these large restoration projects such as the Schulenberg Prairie and also Fermilab National Lab that has 260 hectares of tall grass prairie, which Bob Betts was responsible for starting. That's Bob Betts with the with the drip torch in that picture. Um, so Ray Schulenberg was very important, and um, and that leads us to his protege, Russ Kurt, Russell Kurt. Um, and Russell Kurt was raised in Michigan, um, near Traverse City, Michigan. He got his, I think he got his BS at Michigan State, and I hope I'm right on that. But I know he got his MS at University of Utah. And he's been, he um, taught biology at COD since the 60s. Um, and he is the sole reason that there is a natural areas preserve on the College of DuPage campus. He had no permission whatsoever. He just had a can do attitude, a farmer's work ethic, and a tractor. <laughs> and he, um, he made it happen. And he's a great person. And I've had the great fortune of being able to visit him in Michigan in that top picture. Uh, that was this past September. And then in uh, Iowa, on his land in Iowa, where he has farmland um, and prairie land out in, in Iowa. Um, and he's still doing it. I mean, he's still farming. He's still doing the restoration. He does CRP, which is Conservation Reserve Program. That's through the um, Department of Agriculture and uh, commonly known as the program to pay farmers not to farm, although it's really integral in making sure to prevent erosion and things of that nature. But but yeah, just look at how happy he is in that picture repping a, repping a college DuPage hat there. And that's us drying seed actually. He's got, he's very inventive as you can see and always has been. And he um, he's using a vacuum to kind of blow air through the seed to dry it quicker, which is really important because you want to have dry seed, which we'll talk about later. Um, to make sure mildew doesn't grow and to make sure the seeds are as productive as they can be. So Ray Schulenberg was Russ Kurt's mentor. And in this picture, you can see Russ with the shock white hair and you can see uh, Ray Schulenberg right here next to him. Now, I don't remember the exact 
um, titles of these two on the side, but I know they went on to have prolific um, bot botany careers. One of them was a lead botanist for the U.S. Forest Service for the federal government, and Russ taught these two people. So Russ had a big effect on a lot of different um, people that went on to do ecological restoration, and me, myself included. I mean, he's he's continues to have uh, an effect on me and a mentorship on me that that I really appreciate. Um, all most I shouldn't say all most of the knowledge and passion stemmed from Ray, but actually most of the plants and seeds that exist on the campus of College of DuPage came from Ray Schulenberg's um, restoration at the nearby Morton Arboretum. The Morton Arboretum is near, I don't know, two minute drive from College of DuPage in Lyle, um, and so all the seed that that was produced for that area came from remnant prairies those areas along the railroads and the cemeteries within 50 miles. And so whatever Russ didn't get from the Schulenberg Prairie, he sourced from those from those remnants nearby. Um, and that's something that we try to, to stay true to to this day. Um, so here's kind of a plat of the original uh, or original plat of the Milton Township. Um, and this was drawn in 1840. You can see that it's mostly open prairie. So where we're at is what we're trying to, you kind of use this as a reference source, kind of like how Elder Leopold and others tried to find references for what to restore to or what the goal is. Um, we try to restore to an open prairie. There is an abundance of wetlands, which stands true to how wet this area is. Anyone that's been around Glen Ellen, Lombard, um, this general vicinity will know that, that houses tend to flood and areas tend to take on a lot of water. And College of DuPage is no different. Um, it makes the nature preserves here that much more important because they act as that sponge that's, that's definitely needed. Um, there are timber areas um, that are referenced on this plat, and those are the oak savanna groves, which is probably the most decimated. Uh, I know Stephen Packard, the Somme Prairie Steward and, and just kind of guru of this sort of ecological restoration movement in Chicagoland, um, talks a lot about how Burr Oak Savannas is one of the most decimated um, habitats. And while Russ tried to start restoring it, and we're continuing to try to restore it, the, the Oak Savannah, as you can see in my picture behind me, this is kind of the, the COD uh, Oak Savannah restoration. Um, it's really hard. It's really hard to do because you have to have these massive oaks. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of them are cut down or kind of just built around. So, um, and then just interesting fact, Glen Ellen is referenced on here as Babcock's Grove, which is about Glen Ellen. So, all right. So now we get to the, um, to the natural areas. So anyone that's familiar with College of DuPage will, will understand um, this map, when I look at it, I kind of can't help but sigh because it's really great that there are these 40 acres of natural areas spread across three preserves on campus. I mean, that's huge. Um, it's the most amount of natural area on any given campus in the country. Other colleges and universities have more acreage of natural area. They just, they're just off campus. So we're kind of unique here that people can go from the building. This is the Health and Science Center and just walk out to the prairie, which we have plenty of classes that do. However, when I look at this, I see the 100 or so acres of pavement for, for parking lots. And that just, that just has rain go right through it in a rain event. And, um, and Russ had these big visions of having one big tall parking garage and then prairie all around it. Um, unfortunately, the engineers at the time said, no way, it's a safety concern, this, that, and the other. And so they just keep building parking lots and they keep repaving them. And, and so that's a battle we might've lost there, but, but here are the three preserves and I'll go into each one. So this is the one at the uh, Northeast corner of campus along Fowell and Park. Um, it's 15 acre preserve. This was the first preserve started in 1975. Um, it's got marsh woodland and reconstructed prairie. As you can see in the woodland, there's a lot of understory that we've been cutting out. Um, in this picture, you can kind of see this. These this is where the honeybee hives are, and we, we'll go into we'll go into that whether or not that's a good thing or not for the natural areas here. Um, and then here's kind of it during the growing season, and you can see. I mean, I, if I was interactive, I'd say, "What's this species?" But there might be too many of you, so I'll just tell you: it's calorie pear tree, which is which is a nemesis for us. Um, and it was planted uh, all along campus in the early 2000s. 
and now we're dealing with the ramifications of that. So, um, so this is the ecological study area. This is kind of a map, an overhead map of it, and you can kind of see. So this is this is interesting to see. So you have 2000 and 2018. A lot of it looks similar, actually, which is good. Um, you know, we've always had a problem right here with with some walnuts invading, and walnuts have allelopathy or, or kind of a poison in their roots, so they they tend to take over and kind of alter the soil chemistry of an area. And we've been able to kind of tamp that down with with regular burning and, and brush cutting. However, you'll notice a big difference right here. This is a perfectly mowed area, right here. It's prairie. So this was the big. This is a big thing that happened um, along a lot in between 07 and 18. And we'll go into how um, between 09 and 16. So about for for seven years there was no management of the areas. And in that time, the administration decided to to put turf grass over <coughs> over the area. And this is so this is a hillside, so it's a very steep slope. And right now we're dealing with the ramifications of that because prairie plants are trying to grow through and the area is eroding. And so I've asked multiple times to try to convert it back to prairie. Haven't succeeded yet, but I'm gonna still fight for it. I know Russellwood as well. Um, and so we're we're hoping that we can. We can change that in the future. So this is him. <laughs> this is him burning the area originally back in the day. And as you can see, man, he's so cool looking in every picture. But this is him in his flannel, and he's got a rake. And there's not exactly safety equipment. And I think that's the wooden sign getting burned up there. <laughs> but fast forward, this is us a year ago, pretty much right before lockdown in March, we got a really good burn in. Um, and this is just kind of a great picture to encapsulate it. Um, Susan Kurt, Russ's daughter, who's a professor at Chicago State University and someone that I work with regularly, she actually took this photo and she she takes a lot of these photos, which is great that she's still involved. Um, and you can see that's me on the truck. I got a walkie talkie. One big thing, we're all wearing fire suits. You got a water backpack, you got a, a UTV with a water tank. Um, and so it's a, it's kind of more of a sophisticated uh, uh, operation. Although I will say I have almost burned some wooden signs. So uh, just to keep continuing that legacy. Uh, here are some old pictures as well. This is him, I think that same day. Um, this, this is Russ spreading seed. This is Russ with a student. Um, this is kind of a modern day photo where you can see that there are some paths through the woodland. And then these are the students that originally planted it. And it was originally planted in kind of farmed rows. Um, it wasn't until later that that kind of the science changed and Russ changed his strategy and, and started doing it more kind of natural, natural like and less less row like. All right, so this is the Russell R. Kurt Prairie. Um, this is uh, the main preserve on campus, kind of the one in the middle that you saw at the beginning. Um, and it used to be the West Prairie. It was in, I think, 2003 or around then when it was renamed the Russell R. Kurt Prairie. Um, and there's this great YouTube video where he came and spoke um, and talked about the history. And um, if anyone wants, I can send them that link. Um, it's in, or if you just want to search Russell R. Kurt College of DuPage on YouTube, you'll find it. And he gives a lot of great history. Um, Sorry, this orientation is a little weird, but this is kind of an overhead map of it. North is this way, south is this way. Um, so this used to be a gravel parking lot, uh, especially right here. Um, this actually used to be a road too, before this was built, this was a road through here. Um, so there's a lot of disturbance that we're dealing with, um, but Russ tried to make the area mostly full sun prairie. Then there's some marshed areas. This is supposed to be the bur oak savanna. So these are all bur oaks that were planted. Um, and then a swale. And then this corner is kind of a hill prairie where he took the tractor and made it kind of a mounded area. So we have plants that like it drier that can survive there. And what's interesting with the gravel parking lot legacy is that it's actually much drier throughout. So we can get some species that, that prefer it a little drier, like butterfly milkweed, for instance, the orange Asclepius tuberosa that can grow here because it is dry enough. Um, so that's kind of an interesting legacy. Here's a picture, Brian McQuaid, the former 
um, prairie manager took these pictures. So you can see in the fall um, what it looks like before the burn on the top left. You can see what it looks like after the burn on the top right. And then at the bottom, you can see in the spring when it starts to grow up. Um, and actually that that's a Kentucky coffee tree, Gymnocladus, and uh, it's no longer there because it was spreading. <laughs> And here's some more modern day photos of uh, the area. Of course, another shameless plug of a burn photo. They seem to be the most aesthetically pleasing. Um, but also you see some, some yellow cone flower that was planted, um, some Onethra, some um, primrose type of, of things there. You even see some prairie smoke in the front. Um, this is pale purple cone flower along, and then you see one of the Leopold benches as well. And then in this bottom corner, you can see that there is a lot of cattail. And cattail is something that has um, maybe wasn't originally an issue, but has become more and more of a nuisance. So that's something that we're definitely eyeing to to get better in the in the future to deal with with the uh, with the cattail population. As you can see in the map right here, this used to be all open water, and now it's it's mostly just mostly just cattails. So we're gonna. Our near future plans are to are to deal with that. Um, so that's on our agenda. Uh, the third preserve. This is in the bottom um, southwest corner of campus. Is the BJ Hodnot Wildlife Sanctuary. So this is a nine acre preserve. Um, 1983. It was gifted to the college from Bert Hodnot, who owned the land, and he was a, he was a nature enthusiast, a bird enthusiast. Um, there's so at the bottom there's a there's a website link to a blog done by the Briarcliff Lakes uh, HOA former HOA president. So that's so that's the um, the apartment complex that runs adjacent to this. Um, this actually is a really important. I found out recently this is a very important kind of flood mitigation area, and I'll kind of show you this map here. So this is the HOA I'm referring to up here. Um, and this is a really important flood zone kind of area for the village of Glen Ellen, the city of Wheaton, and College of DuPage. So it was kind of controversial recently where it was caught up in some litigation. Um, and so they had to kind of add annex to this area, which was called Pond 9. Um, so they actually had a contractor come out when no one was managing it, because, and we'll get into why no one was managing it but uh, they vegetated the shoreline and we're hoping in the future that we're able to kind of extend the whole preserve to be kind of all of, all of this. Cause right now it's turf grass, nobody goes over there um, and it, it should be native vegetation um, to be able to deal with the, with the stormwater runoff and to be a, a flood mitigation zone. Um, I will say that not much restoration work has been done in the BJ Hodnot Wildlife Sanctuary. So all this right here, you can kind of see is like a thicket of um, non-native brush. So there are some silver maples and some sugar maples in there, but it's mostly um, box elder and uh, buckthorn, which are not, which are invasive. And so we're, we're hoping to get those out of there. This is kind of our third priority. Um, so we deal with the first two preserves first because they're seen more and they're accessed by students more, but this is definitely on our agenda. So here's another kind of, overview if you forgot. So we got the ecological study area, which is the first um, that was restored by Russ, this Russell Kirk Prairie that was third, and then this, I mean, second, and then this one, which not much has been done uh, at the BJ Hodnot Wildlife Sanctuary. So I just, I mentioned Brian McQuaid. Um, I just want to include a picture here and kind of talk about him for a second. So when Russell Kirk retired, officially in 2000. He established himself as the prairie manager for a year, and in that time he trained Brian to become the next prairie manager, which is really important that um, there was a steward here from the year 2000 through 2009. Um, now, Brian didn't quit in 2009. Um, I, I didn't even used to mention this, uh, but I figured enough time has passed um, that we can talk about it. Um, so Dr. Bruder was the president at the time, and he was not a fan of the prairie, among other things. And he made a lot of changes. And one of the changes that he made was the elimination of the prairie manager position. So he wasn't able to fire Brian, but he eliminated his position and kind of put him into the grounds department, um, where he was just kind of using a weed whip and, and shoveling snow. So he soon left that job for the DuPage County Forest Preserve District. 
And that's why from 2009 to 2016, there was no management. Now, I'll just throw these out here. I won't say anything else, but um, it's, it's an interesting uh, research if you want to go on Google and, and just search uh, Dr. Bruder's legacy there. Ironically enough, originally a plant science major. Okay, so then enter 2016. This is when I, um, so there was a vice president at the time. So Dr. Bruder left and then the, the cabinet at the time um, kind of tried to um, shed, shed the former legacy that, or, or the infamous legacy. So but one way of doing that was to uh, reestablish the prairie manager position. Uh, luckily enough, I got it. And so here I am. And um, I just, I still work with Brian McQuaid. Um, he comes in a few times a year and we, we talk regularly. So he still has a hand in the stewardship of this area. And of course, I still talk to Russell Kurt. And I think it's really important to, to have a continuation of, of, of the legacy of, of, of being a steward of these areas. Um, but now I'll just kind of go into what, what I, kind of the impact I, I've had a hand in, in helping. Um, so since 2016, we were able to get uh, our social media up and running. We established a bunch of student worker positions. Um, we have a bunch of volunteers and we reestablished a bunch of collaboration. So in the past, Russ would trade seeds with uh, and sell seeds really to, to seed companies. Um, and so we kind of reignited those kind of dormant relationships. And so now we trade seeds with Fermilab, Norton Arboretum, DuPage County Forest Preserve District. And we just, we continue to try to make sure the seed is from within 50 miles. Um, so on top is a picture of the volunteers. What, one example of, of a, a group of students, you know, pre-pandemic, obviously, um, but we had quite a few students, quite a few student workers. And what's great about the student workers is that they're able to get their fire certification, their herbicide certification, and, a, you know, a great a vast knowledge of, of native and non-native flora and fauna. And so when they leave College of DuPage, they're set up for success because they have all of this baseline of, of experience. And that's really important uh, to us as student success. So that's something that we've been able to, to help foster. I will say that we, we got honeybee hives with a grant for better or for worse is what I say, because there's a lot of debate about, because honeybees are not native to the area. And that's a whole nother discussion. Uh, there are plenty of bee species, but only one bee species that produces honey, and those are honeybees. Um, and these are these particular uh, subspecies of, of honeybees are, are native to uh, Italy. And so we've essentially put on these, you know, cattle or human bred for generations honeybees that now compete with native pollinators. So we're kind of we're, we're keeping an eye on that. We're wanting to study that um, just to make sure that we're not hindering our mission of, of kind of restoring native habitat. Um, but the honeybees are great for not only attracting students, um, but also like utilizing the honey to, to, to show our, what we're able to accomplish. Um, there's now a class in horticulture where it's taught um, that's very popular. So, you know, there, there are other factors that we have to consider. Here are just some more pictures. Um, a lot of pictures, a lot of pictures in here. So you're gonna have to bear with me, but so we have, Man, it's crazy to see all these pictures with all these students and people without face masks on, right? But um, you can kind of see the different, some of the different activities that, that the students do. So we have large groups that come out either for tours or for cutting brush or for planting plants. There's always something to do. And so we put them to work. And it's a great way, even if they're not that interested, you know, I was talking to Jamie at the beginning, it's just a great way for them to get out and, and experience nature. And like a lot of times they'll come in and, and they're, they're really not happy about having to be out there, um, but then ultimately they're glad that they that they came. Here are just some numbers, kind of more pictures of we we reuse buckets for seed collection, um, and we have different kinds of groups that come out um, and work with us. So we're able to kind of get people on campus, which is really great. And you know, luckily Russ made all these really nice trails, so it's really easy to walk through the areas. Um, and so we just try to keep that going. Here's an example of a work events calendar. Um, as you can see, we have Prairie Work Days all the time. Um, we have tours and we also have kind of other events like birding tours and whatnot. And you can see all this stuff on the, on the website or COD Natural Areas, um, which is on social media and things like that. Too many tours to count. I'm being a bit facetious there, but there are a lot of different kinds of tours. 
So we'll have different people come out. Um, and, you know, there's so many students usually on campus where we can have a big turnout. Um, so the, John Sabula on the left, he does bird surveys regularly here. And so whenever he does a bird survey, we'll just have a tour that goes along with it. And those seem really popular. We also have a, a native bee expert, Terry Meesley, that comes out and he'll talk about native bees and he'll kind of point out the bumblebees and the carpenter bees and blah, blah, blah. And then we'll have the middle one is the, the Glen Ellen Environmental Commission came out. And, and so we'll kind of talk to them and, and they'll tell us about what they're doing in their yards and things. And actually there's a forum on the COD website that anyone, if you have a group or even just you and a few people want a tour, you just fill out the form and it'll go to me and I can help facilitate a tour or a work day for you and get you out there and get you and your group out there because uh, we want to be as accessible as, as possible. Um, and then, yeah, just, just to kind of elaborate on student involvement, um, yeah, we have all the tours, but also that pavilion right there. So I know it's not exactly prairie stuff, but getting any inch of turf grass here that's not turf grass is, is a success in my book. So you can kind of see the, the community garden that we recently got going that I have a bit of a hand in, which is a whole nother talk too. Um, that's adjacent to it, but students in architecture actually designed and built this beautiful pavilion, kind of in a prairie style, Frank Lloyd Wright style. And so students are, and you'll see students here, obviously pre, everything's pre-pandemic, but they get Wi-Fi out here. So they'll go and they'll sit out here on this pavilion and then they'll have the vista of the prairie. And, and you know, there have been studies that show that even just exposure or sitting near or looking out on a natural area like a prairie it can be beneficial to students studying or just people's mental health and well-being. Um, so here, and I can, you know, put this in the chat or whatever, but it's basically COD natural areas on all the um, social media. This is one thing that's really great for students to to help with because they're much well more well versed in this sort of stuff than I am. So, so they help run that. So uh, now we're kind of pivoting to steps to restoration. So you guys know a lot of this stuff already. I'll just kind of point out, um, or we'll kind of like dive into it again. So problems associated with why we need restoration. Fragmentation is a big thing. So historically, you saw that old plat of Milton Township. <clears throat> it was a vast expanse of land. Well, obviously, we've built roads, we've built buildings, uh, we've built farms, we've put fences in. And these all prevent seeds and animals from carrying seeds and dispersing seeds. And just a lot of problems arise with fragmentation. Fire suppression for years, for decades, for hundreds of years. Even now, people think fire and they think danger. I mean, wildfires out west, yeah, that's really dangerous. Well, that's for a lot of other reasons. You know, it's too dry. They're building houses where they shouldn't be built. And it's a forested area. We live in a grassland. So... <sighs> While it can be dangerous, I don't want to minimize what could be dangerous about it. It is a different, it's a different ball game here. And, uh, and so the, the culture has shifted quite a bit where people are in support of fire. You see, if you know John McCabe and his Cook County emails, they're burning hundreds and hundreds of acres, every county in Collar County, a lot of counties in Illinois and, and around the Midwest are starting to burn and people are starting to understand, uh, but you still come up against fire suppression, uh, exotic species. So the more it rains, there are the more uh, invasive species that come in. Buckthorn, for instance, say English settlers bring it over buckthorn. Well, buckthorn now shades out the area, grows a bunch of berries, spreads more buckthorn, shades the area, produces a bunch of berries, produces more buckthorn. And it's just a positive feedback cycle that um, if, if it's not stopped, it will just turn into a thicket of, of brush and understory, which is not what was historically here. Um, so in order to deal with that, we do things every season. So we clear brush, we, we collect seed from certain areas, put it in other areas, we pull weeds, we spray weeds, we do, we do prescribe fires. Um, we propagate new seed, seedlings and we plant new seedlings. And we all, we do this just constantly on a rotational basis to make sure that we're staying on top of things. Cause if we don't stay on top of things, well, it'll turn into a, a, a something unrecognizable and something undesirable. So in the spring, you can see this is backpack sprayer. Um, he's on turf grass, obviously, but we'll go through in, in the early spring and we'll spray certain pesky perennial weeds um, or biennial weeds, such as 
um, you know, bull thistle, burdock, reed canary grass, that sort of thing, crown vetch, um, I could go on. Uh, we also conduct prescribed fires in the spring. A lot of times on areas that are that have a hill or are slanted, we'll do that in the spring because if we do it in the fall, erosion might happen with the snow and the snow melt. And we also spread seed and we'll put seed blanket on like that or we'll plant uh, plant plugs. In the summer, that's Russ Kurtz collecting seed. That's us collecting seed in modern times and that's people growing plants in the greenhouse. So we'll kind of collect seed. We'll start to grow them in the greenhouse, get them ready for the fall because we do like to do a lot of planting in the fall. Um, and we kind of just stay on top of weeding and stay on top of seed collection. Seed collection, I mean, different things produce seeds at different times. So you really got to stay on top of that. And we try to collect the most amount that we can. We never collect more than 50% because we want a lot of seed to spread in the area, but we will kind of put area, put seed from one preserve on the other preserve and vice versa, just to kind of spread the genes out and not have a gene bottleneck occur. In the autumn, you can see that's all the seed that we collected and that's drying. So we make sure to dry the seed or as rusted it with very inventive, like with the vacuum cleaner blowing, blowing the air, whatever it takes, we dry it out. We do more seed collection into October, November, and we do more burning. I mean, I'll do, I'll put burn photos on every slide if I'm able to. I mean, that's just, that's just how I, how I operate. Um, okay. And then the winter, what do we do with all that seed? Well, we spread it, especially if it's snowing. Then when the snow melts, we can get a, a, a nice layer of seed. Um, we also clear brush. This is the big thing we do. We cut down bigger trees too, but but we do less of that um, because we want to get the understory first, and then eventually we'll get the overstory. But we'll we'll create these piles of brush. We'll move the piles around, and then we'll burn them in bonfires. Luckily, the village of Glen Ellen, who oversees us, they let us do this. Some municipalities don't. So if you're considering doing this on your area, make sure to check with with all this stuff that it's legal to do so. But it is the easiest way to get rid of the uh, the brush. Um, I would chip it if I could, but we don't have a chipper and I don't have the space to chip it. And you can see the kind of thicket of understory on the left and then when it looks more cleared out. You can imagine a deer or some other kind of fauna trying to run through it, how much easier it is um, when it's more cleared out. So these are some old pictures. Um, this is Russ Kurt's truck. He and his wife, Pam, who may or may not be on this call, <laughs> um, would grow these plants pro bono in their yard in their driveway in West Chicago back in the day, not a dime cost to the college. Um, and then they would have students plant it. And then a big thing when you plant, um, when you plant plugs is that you wanna make sure that you water it. So Russ, of course, inventive man that he was set up these irrigation uh, pipes, which would be hard to do nowadays. So that's why we kind of rely on seed a little more. And then with the plants, we sell the plants to homeowners like yourselves on this call um, because they're able to, to be able to go in their backyard and water it in a way that they have to be. So if you plant plant plugs, they have to be watered a lot in the first year, first two years to make sure that they establish. But once they establish, they don't need much work at all, but you do need to take that time to water them at the beginning. Um, here are some other old photos. That's compass plant, and these are all black and white, so it's a little hard to see, but you can kind of see the, the black-eyed Susan on the right, the compass plant, compass plant flowers in the middle, and the compass plant leaves on the left. Of course, uh, some more awesome pictures of Russ burning back in the day. I just, just so cool. I wish I could have been there for it. Um, but luckily I'm able to, to have the pictures. Um, here are some other various pictures of what we, what we have going on at CRD. Um, so students made those Leopold benches like that one that the students sit on, but they also made a couple of picnic benches too. So people can, there's a little area cleared out in the Russell Kirk Prairie where people can come and study in nature, which is important for people to get out in nature. Uh, you can see I'm almost burning that wooden sign, just like in the legacy of Russ, but we're, we have a water pack on it. And then that's um, in the bottom right is a little picture of the plant sale um, that, we op that we used to operate every spring. We're hoping to do that again and expand it. And then Bill Whitney, who's the local bee guy up in the corner, he, he's helped us kind of advise us on things with the honeybees. Um, so aspirations for future years, 
Um, we want to expand those plant sales. So we want to, you know, be a big source of native plants because people within the region want plants that were produced from within the region. So we, we can tell you the provenance of the seeds that produce the plants that will go in your backyard. So we want to expand the plant sales. We, we want to also have people that care take on, you know, really important species like threatened species like American burnet or um, leafy prairie clover. And then they can collect the seed, bring it to me, and we can have more. We can have more of that species. Um, so this this is kind of an example of of just what we what we want to do. So we want to take care of cattails. We want to convert some areas to to prairie, and we want to uh, clear some brush. So those are kind of um, efforts that are coming in years to come. And then I know we're getting a little tight on time here, so I'm going to run through these. But um, but intro to what you can do to help. So you see in the bottom right, that's a cultural legacy. Got to have a turf grass lawn. Got to have the servants out there and cut that lawn. Well, no, you can actually have, have some lawn, throw the frisbee on, eat your picnic on, but you can also have some great, really important habitat too. Um, so some easy steps. Um, first, you want to select your site. What kind of sun does it have? Is it full sun? Are there trees? Is it a weedy area? Is it away from a building? Are you going to be able to burn it regularly? That's something that Okay, you can burn next to a building, fine, but it's gonna take a little more effort. Um, check your local ordinance, <laughs> check your HOA. A lot of times they don't even let you do this if you want to, unfortunately, I hope that changes. But also it's important to try to define it too. So either put a fence or mow around it so, so that people know that it, you're supposed to be there and not just a patch of weeds. A lot of times they don't know. Um, easy steps to convert. So I've done it in the past both ways. So you can either boom it with some glyphosate with some non-selective herbicide that's an easy way to do it or you can if you want to get a workout in and be a little more you know environmentally conscious i suppose you could you could use a spade shovel um and then you can till or not till i've heard it both ways um i i kind of tend to think not to till because you want to keep those microorganisms going in there when you till it, it kind of disrupts everything and you start from zero again and, and weeds that thrive in disturbance like ragweed and things will start to invade it. So that's something that you can decide for yourself. Um, so you wanna pay attention to the prairie to forb ratio. What, what I've heard and what I do and what is do more forbs or flowering plants at the beginning, because if you do mostly grasses, it's gonna outcompete all those flowering plants. Um, so you wanna make sure to get a good balance and you wanna make sure to do more flowering plants at first. Eventually you can put more grasses in, but be careful with that. Um, you can either do plugs like in that picture or seed like in the picture of people spreading seed. What I will say is plugs are, and you know plants are expensive, but they establish quicker. If you can water the plant plugs regularly for those first two years, like I said, do plant plugs because those are, those are already going, they'll be successful. The problem is when you do it in a big preserve and you don't have like a watering apparatus, then I'd say do seed because you can't know that you're going to be able to be there and water it when you need to. Um, I will say for the bigger grasses, like big blue stem, Indian grass, uh, and switchgrass, careful with those because those dominate, flop over, shade any other plant that you might have. Um, and there are various vendors that we can go into. Patience is a virtue. Know that it will take three years to look how you want it to look. Um, these are slow growing perennial plants. Think elephants, oaks. Don't think mice and voles and you know, buckthorn. I mean, think it's going to be a long process. Um, annual weeds. So this is a uh, velvet weed to your right. A lot of times in a disturbed area, velvet weed will come up. You want to cut it before it goes to seed. That's really important. So I'd say just those first couple of years, just mow it regularly, like you would mow your lawn, um, maybe a little less frequently, but just before those annual weeds can go to seed. And then eventually the perennial weeds will outcompete the annual weeds. Um, and then burn when you can. So here's some plants to try. You got prairie drop seed, yellow purple coneflower. That's not yellow coneflower, <laughs> yellow coneflower, um, side oats, grandma, uh, white and purple prairie clover, which is that white one right there, and uh, butterfly milkweed. Now butterfly milkweed is beautiful, but it's really hard to like keep going. So make sure you have a dry area and make sure you pay a lot of attention to it. I've seen it die a lot in restorations. Um, some more plants to try. You got prairie blazing star, black-eyed Susan, which establishes quicker. Um, that's definitely one you want to put in there because you're going to, if you don't mind yellow, I've had people say that I don't like yellow. Well, it establishes quickly and it provides pollen and a habitat and it look, I think it looks nice. And then you have uh, wild bergamot, 
in the top right, which is um, grows quickly and establishes early, which is important. And then um, little blue stem, which is another grass that's really beautiful and short statured. Um, again, you want shorter grasses unless it's like a big preserve and you, and it's not next to, and it can be wherever you want it to be. Those big grasses are fine, but wait a year or two before you put those in. Otherwise they'll take over. They'll just take over. Um, some resources and the, the Conservation Foundation has all sorts of resources. Just go to their website and they'll tell you what's up. But their contractors are a dime a dozen. Here's a bunch of them that I'm familiar with. There are countless others. And then municipalities. So you go to your local park district, your local forest preserve. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is a great resource. Chicago Environment Net Environmental Network. If you want a volunteering opportunity, if you want a job in the industry, this is where you want to go. They have a lot of great resources. All you got to do is, is type in Chicago Environmental Network in Google and, and you'll find it. Um, so yeah, that's it. I, I kind of wanted to have a question and answer, but I think we're close to the to the end here. Uh, or no, we have like seven minutes. So. Yeah, we're good. We can take some questions. I just wanted to make a, a couple of comments. First off, you mentioned Terry Measley, who helps with your bees, I yes. think. So Terry actually did a fabulous webinar with us right around the end of the year in December called Flying, Digging, Crawling Through Your Yard, something along those lines. Um, it's on our YouTube channel. Check it out. He's a fabulous photographer. He had amazing pictures and he just very expertly wove together the ideas of, you know, living by a river and, and working with nature and planting native plants and all these things. Really, really a fantastic presentation that he did. So definitely check that one out. Um, I also forgot to mention in the beginning, since you were talking about the, the health benefits, the mental health benefits of being out in nature, tomorrow is our environmental summit. And you can still register for it. It's free. It's virtual this year. So um, check out our website. All the information should be on uh, theconservationfoundation.com. If you go to our events page, you should be able to find all the information you need about that for our environmental summit. So it starts tomorrow morning, I think like 8 or 8.30. So um, definitely make sure to check that out. So wanted to mention that one as well. This was fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, I always love seeing installations like this on a college campus or any kind of school campus, because as you mentioned, we need to get kids involved. We need to, to teach kids how to do this stuff and, and really get them going. So we do have a couple of questions. Um, Susan wanted to know, uh, what is the spray that you used? You mentioned spraying um, some of the weeds. So what do you use? Yeah, so this is an important uh, question. Um, so you can, everyone's familiar with Roundup. So if you're if you're gonna spray your turf grass or just kind of, you just wanna spray the area and have it all be dead. So we call it non-selective herbicide where it doesn't select for one species or the other or type of species or the other. That's Roundup or more importantly, the active ingredient is glyphosate. So if you buy, you can buy other trade names such as Aquanet and Rodeo. You probably want to get one of those two because they're water safe. Who knows how safe? You definitely don't want to just spray it in water. But um, but yeah, the active ingredient is glyphosate. Is the short answer. But if oh, and if you want to do a selective herbicide, so you want to just target uh, broadleaf species, dicots, uh, you know, forbs, and not touch any of the grass, for instance you can get active ingredient triclopyr or the trade name Garlon. Um, or if you want to just spray the grasses and not touch the forbs, you can get post or grass specific selective herbicide. So you can reach out to me for specifics if you want, but that's kind of the gist. And the big thing with any of these, you know, I'm, I'm certified, I'm actually retaking my certification test on Friday, wish me luck. Um, for my the uh, for applying herbicides, the big thing is to follow the label instructions. Um, it, that's none of us like using any of these kinds of chemicals. We don't want to use them, and definitely don't go you know just broadcast spraying everywhere. Um, you know, if we're cutting something like honeysuckle, I actually get out a paintbrush 
and use the paintbrush just on the cut stump so that I don't get it anywhere else. Um, so really sometimes, you know, we hate to do it, but sometimes it's really the only, the only good way of getting rid of this stuff. You know, if you dig, you're disturbing the soil, you can cut, but sometimes stuff like honeysuckle just, as I say, comes back angry. So sometimes it's really just the only way to, to get those things out because we want to protect other things. So, you know, Donna says she doesn't use herbicide because she has well water. I have well water too. Um, but again, that's why I'm really, really careful. And I don't, you know, broadcast spray the stuff in my yard. I, I'm very, very selective to make sure that I only target the plants that I want to get. Stump cutting is really great. You can do it for trees or plants. Purple loosestrife is one we deal with a lot. Yep. And we'll just cut it at the base and just apply a little tiny bit. Um, yep. And that kills it. So, yeah. Or, you know, sometimes even just putting a little bit on a rag and just wiping it on the leaves. Yeah. You know, just that way you use the minimum possible amount. You don't have to worry about overspraying, getting it into other places. So you're protecting the plants that you want to keep while getting rid of other stuff too. Um, Chris wants to know if you have pets, what's safe to use? So, yeah, my short answer, so Monsanto does all the studies for this. So take it with a grain of salt. But um, they're called non-residual, which means you put it on and theoretically right away, it stops being, it stops working. What I will say is just have your dog not go on it for at least an hour, preferably yeah. like a day just to be safe. Um, so, but Technically, scientifically, you don't have to. Um, yeah, and and again, just you know, use as little as possible, only when it's needed. Mm -hmm. Kristen wants to know. I have a small strip in my backyard that backs up against a neighbor's fence. I wanted to plant all natives, tall in the back, shorter toward the front, but the fence is like six feet, and I wanted some more privacy and was going to plant big blue stem. Recommendations. Yeah, and actually I have plenty of that seed because we don't kill big blue stem, but what we'll do is we'll collect the seed and then kind of give it to people that want it because I don't want it. <laughs> but um, what I will suggest with you is look at native shrubs. Um, I might yeah. do a shrub, uh, kind of a line of native shrubs, uh, nine bark, um, viburnum, lentago, some of these other ones, service berry. Um, and that could be, because that means year round, you'll have something back there. Big blue stem's great, um, or switchgrass. Yeah, but just make sure it's kind of like its own area of tall grass. And then maybe in the front, have it be like a shorter grass thing and just be vigilant to kind of pull the big blue stems that come up because it will spread. Grasses are, um, you could call them more evolved. Um, they just spread easier because they spread with wind. They don't need a pollinator. They produce more fertile seeds. So just be vigilant of that. Yeah, and you know, there's even some taller plants that you could add in there that might look nice. Uh, you know, generally I don't recommend silphiums for planting in yards, except in that kind of case. When you have yeah. a big fence, you have something that can handle some taller, um, taller things. Silphiums are a great choice. So something like um, cup plant, cup yeah, cup plant or uh, compass plant or you know, and any of those rosin weed is another one. Um, you know, any of those get a little bit taller and, and we'll add some color and a little interest in there too. Uh, when you close out of this webinar, the, there will be a web page that's got resources on there. Check out our native plant guide. All the plants that are in there are organized by height. So that might help you make some decisions on that. That native plant guide we put out, it's my absolute favorite publication that we have. It's just yeah. full of really great native plants for this area. If you're joining us from LA or somewhere else, check with your uh, you know, local land trust organization or something like that um, for plants that are native to your area. Yeah. All right. Uh, Amy says, sounds like you're a modern day Russ. Great work. Oh, wow. That's the <laughs> highest compliment I've ever received. So thank you. I, I can only, I can only hope for that. And that says, I didn't hear you mention conifers. Which conifers do you recommend for someone wanting screening from neighbors? Not here. Um, the one thing, the one I would suggest is bald cypress. Um, so bald cypress is native to, it's the state tree of Louisiana and it's, it's all over Southern Illinois in the swamps. I will say with climate change, it's latitude is creeping up. So, and it's a beautiful tree. 
it it is a rare conifer in that it it it's deciduous, so it loses its needles. Um, but it's truly beautiful. It can be it can exist in standing water. It grows these knees. Um, so yeah, Taxodium dishtum, I think is the Latin name, but bald cypress would be the only conifer. If you plant a different conifer, you plant a blue spruce, okay? Our soil is way too fertile and clayey. That thing will die in 10, 15, 20 years, maybe later. But I'm just saying, it's not supposed to be here. And it, it doesn't like the super hot summers. Um, and it doesn't like the super clayey soil. So just careful with conifers. Yeah, when I moved into my house, the original landscapers had thrown in about a dozen evergreen trees and called it a day. <laughs> now I'm dealing with 20 foot tall half dead trees. Yeah. So trying to get those out and planting oaks and, and other things in, in their place. And it's just a pain. Mm -hmm. What, how do you feel about Eastern red cedar? Not good. <laughs> um, so I've seen them take over. So I talked about the CRP land conservation reserve program. Um, especially if you go downstate and kind of out West, you'll see that they spread like crazy and they are actually quite invasive. I mean, I think if you have them in your backyard, it's not a big deal, um, but I would just say, just try to find, you know, plant an oak or, <laughs> or plant a walnut, uh, not a walnut, uh, yeah, walnut or a hickory, sorry, what am I saying? Plant a hickory, not a walnut, um, but just look into native deciduous trees, um, as opposed to conifers. I don't know, Jamie, what do you think of Eastern Red Cedar? You know, I'm, I'm kind of torn. I was actually just looking at these the other day and I've kind of, I've, I've heard it both ways, whether or not they're actually native in, here in Illinois. So I, I, I do know, however, in disturbed areas, they're one of the first things you see popping up. And to me, that's always a red flag. Mm -hmm. And anything that, that appears in a disturbed area without you planting it, that to me is, is a red flag that it that it's kind of invasive so um that's that's why i asked because i don't know they could they can be nice trees but I, I i don't know yeah and i'm not gonna judge anyone for picking any <laughs> tree you know, as long as it isn't turf grass and you're not fertilizing it twice a year and it serves really no ecological purpose you know those trees are is refuge a refuge for birds um mm -hmm. and I'll, you know have other benefits so and it's not a calorie pair and it's not a calorie <laughs> pair if you can take away one thing from today it's do not plant calorie paired trees yes <laughs> they're illegal in a lot of states not this state but um yeah they, they should, should be, be. Yeah. yeah for sure all right let's see one more question pop up oh Anne says eastern red cedar is very invasive in southwest iowa so yeah yeah, especially on farmland, you'll see it really yeah. be an issue. All right. Well, Remick, I want to thank you so much for this presentation. This was really great. I learned a lot about the prairie. I knew it was there, but I didn't know the history behind it and, and all the work and everything that's gone into it. So that's been very cool. So um, next uh, up on our list to be certified for sure. Yes, yes, that's that's on the agenda. And just thank you, Jamie, for having me. It's been a pleasure. Um, and I look forward to all the future webinars that you've, you've very greatly coordinated, so. Thank you, thank you. So since you're all here, I'm, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. We haven't let it out to the public yet, but coming up in March, we have a webinar with Chris Benda, the Illinois botanizer. I am really looking forward to that one. He's gonna be talking about the hidden treasures of Illinois. So I can't wait for that one. I'm super excited. So he's, he's uh, a big deal. That's awesome. He is a big deal. And I was very excited when he agreed to do a webinar for us. So uh, keep your eye out for that. That will be in March. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, stay safe and, and come back and see us again next week when we talk about the issues of plastic pollution with the Shedd Aquarium. So thanks. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.